and I look forward. I, I'd just like to thank Councillor McKeever, first of all, uh, for the job he done in the uh, past year. I always found him fair and concise and allowed the meetings to flow, along with uh, his Vice Chair, Alderman McCready, uh, who also carried out uh, his duties well when called upon. And I look forward to working with John and all the officers in this coming year, as well as my Deputy Chair, Councillor Fleming. So, John, if you'd like to go ahead from there and read out the summons. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, wishing you all the best this year in your new role, okay. and indeed the uh, the Deputy Chairperson, Councillor Fleming. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, members, to all members of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee. You are hereby summoned to attend a remote meeting of the committee to be held today, Tuesday the 2nd of June at 4 o'clock. Um, just checking down through the roll, members, and uh, this is not an alphabetical order today. Uh, Councillor Fleming. Paul Fleming. Sure, John. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Councillor Michaela Boyle. Michaela, are you there, please? Okay. Councillor Sandra Duffy. Sure. Thank you, Sandra. Councillor Cooper. So, sure, John. Thank you, Michael. Councillor Mooney. Here, John. Thanks, John. Councillor McKeever. Councillor Kim McKeever. Okay. Councillor Riley. Yes, John, I'm here. Thanks, Martin. Councillor John Boyle. Yeah, I'm here, John. Councillor Bresland. Here, John. Councillor McCready. Yeah, John, I'm here. Councillor McClintock. Sorry, Alder yeah. McClintock. Yeah. Um, Councillor Donnelly. I'm John. And Councillor Gallagher. I'm John. John. Thank you, Paul. So just checking there um, for Councillor Boyle, Michaela Boyle. And Councillor Jim McKeever. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alderman Guy, would you like me to read the statement for remote meetings? Or you, you got that there? I have it here. Uh, I can read that out, John. Uh, yep. Um, okay. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who's in uh, attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use of storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website. Can I just add the reminder to all members uh, to keep our deliberations short uh, as we can find these virtual meetings drag on a bit. Uh, so just become a bit tiresome. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. So, uh, the declaration of members' interests. Anyone just put them in the chat box there as we go along. And let's see now. Chairperson's business. Now, I would just like to take this opportunity. Um, I've already said my, my thanks for outgoing chair and coming in. But I'd just like to take this opportunity to pass on congratulations for the Waterside uh, Royal British Legion, the Solace Highland Dancers, and the U3A Foil Branch and Eglinton Community Hall and being awarded the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service uh, for outstanding work carried out within the community, uh, such as uh, community fundraising and so on. I'd just like to wish them all the best for that there. Okay. And confirmation open in minutes.
Hi there, folks. Uh, uh, confirmation open in minutes here. Uh, pages 1 to 18 for uh, clarity. Okay. Any matters arising from them? or? Sure, happy to propose them for accuracy first. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Accuracy, yep. I'll, I'll stop. stop. Okay. So... Mark, Councillor Riley and Councillor Gallagher, first and second. Uh, any matters arising from the minutes? No, no matters arising, no. I uh, will move on then uh, to the first item. Uh, for guiding principles for working safely. Chair, sure. sure, sorry, could I come in just briefly under matters arising? Sorry, John. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Members, just to update you on household recycling centres, um, Donna and Newton Stewart reopened yesterday. Eglinton Park and Plum Bridge are under review later this week. Um, but we've had an issue this morning with Glendermott Road and have had to temporarily close Glendermott Road um, due to uh, a, a joint inspection this morning with the Health and Safety Executive. No issues inside the site, but there were difficulties in the queuing system outside the site. Um, those of you who know the site will know that there are other businesses in and around that business park, uh, a number of which have um, started trading again or are um have vehicles going in and out of that area um as a result of that and the number of vehicles that were turning up at the site we have voluntarily closed the site um until such times as we can put in place safe queuing arrangements now that there are additional there's an additional volume of traffic on that site um so we will be advising of that in a press statement later this afternoon um both to members and to the public and will then be seeking a method for reopening it as soon as possible, with perhaps requiring us to move to a booking system for that particular site. So it's simply to update members of that developing situation this afternoon, and we keep you appraised as we work through the challenges associated with it. Okay, thanks, John, for that there. Uh, Could I see? possibly come in on that, please? Yeah, All right. I just I just see there's a list here. Uh, let's see. Right, so uh, Councillor Donnelly, you want to come in there? Yeah, thank you, Alderman uh, Guy, and congratulations on the on position as chair. Um, wish you all the best. <clears throat> it's just the issue uh, regarding the uh, waterside site there. Uh, I had brought up previously about the numbers of, after speaking to some of the workers there, some of the numbers of the vehicles that were uh, making use of that site. And uh, it's just that some of the staff are concerned. You see, as it opens up, when we when we start going into the work with vans and trailers and that, there's just some concerns that, you know, for them, the when the skip is filled, Obviously, when it's when it co if we get to that stage where where trailers and and fans are using it, it'll become busier, and then it takes fifteen minutes for the skip to be uh, removed. I'm just wondering, is it an option that we could uh, maybe pilot something where that the any trailers or or white fans or vans could be uh, directed to the Strafoil site where. Would be a quicker turnaround. But is that something that that council officers could uh, consider, given that you know, there is a, a, a an issue with the the queuing system? Would that would that be an idea? Yeah, that's that's a very good suggestion, Councillor Donnelly. We we look at all of those things. We are actually one of the updates I wanted to provide today is we are now generally accepting vans and trailers uh, from domestic users. Um, following feedback from members last week. Um, but now that we do have a particular difficulty with that site, we look at bespoke arrangements for it. Um, it may well simply be just an issue um, for a short period 
Um, but I suspect as the businesses in that area begin to reopen, it, it may develop into something that we need to put alternative arrangements in place. So that's a good suggestion that we we'll take on board and look at that. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Um, Councillor Riley, you were looking there? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And like others, just want to wish you well in your year ahead and also to the Deputy Chair. Um, Alderman uh, Fleming for our side, Councillor Fleming for uh, for his term as deputy chair. Uh, John, just on Glendermott Road, then um, I'm just wondering about the the issues of it not being open uh, and people still coming to it and maybe uh, just abandoning their waste at the site. Uh, what measures can be put in place to make sure that that doesn't happen? Uh, and in terms of the opening times of the other businesses. Um, maybe if they're not trading as uh, late into the evening when Glendermott Road will still be open, is there a mechanism there for uh, for still having it open, but um, later um, later on the day to, uh, until we can get the traffic issues sorted out? Just a couple of suggestions. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Riley. Again, good suggestions. We'll definitely put in place a, a mechanism whereby we will monitor the site for illegal dumping outside the site. Um, it may be one of the options that we look at staggering the opening hours uh, to quieter times, but we're just sort of assessing that situation today. So we'll look at all of those options going forward. Thank you. And uh, Alderman McClintic, you want it in there? Yes, thanks, Chair, and congratulations on your appointment as Chair. My point really was similar to Councillor Donnelly's. Um, I spoke to the new Chair of Environment and Regeneration just a couple of minutes before the meeting, and he was suggesting the very same thing, that Strathfoyle might be a possible uh, use for the fans because it's obviously not as busy down there. The other thing it does concern me a wee bit, the press statement hasn't gone out on, on this yet, and yet um, it has appeared on some Facebook pages, and just even the, the Chair, the new Chair of Environment and Regeneration didn't know about this. So just a wee bit concerned of what's happened during, uh, through the media there. But we'll pick that up later, maybe at another time. Thanks, Chair. Um, okay. Very developing situation, Alderman McClintock. We were, um, I was keen that you would be advised in governance and strategic planning at four o'clock before we issued an official press release. Um, and also um, to be clear around the messaging of it, because um, obviously, when health and safety executives are involved, we have to be very clear that there are no major health and safety issues. It is a queuing system issue. I was concerned with some of the wording um, that was emerging there, that it looked like there was a health and safety issue on the site, which it is not. Um, and so we're just being very careful that we communicate the correct message. So hopefully that will all be clarified today. Just given the um, heightened interest, let's say there are household recycling centers at the moment, Okay, John, thanks for that there. I, I have to admit, I, I did uh, put it out on my social media. Um, however, I did say that it was down to the fact that, th that there was just too much traffic coming in with all our businesses on site. Uh, I, I just ask people to share it, just to get the word out there. There will be a corporate press release going out shortly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so. Everybody now speaking here, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll go next to item eight, guiding principles for working safely. And I think, is it Denise that's going to? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, members. Members, the purpose of this report is to seek your endorsement for the guiding principles for working safely, which we have developed to facilitate the return of our staff to work as and when it is safe to do so. Um, members will be fully aware that at the minute there's no formal end to the government restrictions and work, but it is important that we plan now for what is likely to be a staged return to the workplace um, over a prolonged period of time. But the nature and timing of our operational recovery will obviously be informed by all relevant guidance and regulations. Um, and we will always have the following core principles at the heart of any decisions that we make. Firstly, public health, then the health and safety and well-being of our staff, the operational considerations, there'll be full consultation and engagement. We'll obviously be dynamic and responsive and have clear and transparent communications. 
Um, <clears throat> we have reviewed all the relevant legislation and guidance that is out there at the minute and subsequently prepared a set of guiding principles for working safe safely for Dairy City and Strabane District Council, which we hope can be used to facilitate the return of our staff to work as and when it is safe to do so. Um, now, if members refer to the appendix, you'll see that there's a, a number of pages there, which I don't propose to go through in detail, but it, it um, goes into a number of different categories, for example, who should go to work protecting people um, in our teams who may be higher risk, um, considering the people who need to self-isolate, how will we maintain social distancing at work and the offices, um, taking into consideration how we come to work and leave work, how we move around the buildings and workstations, how we actually and workstations, how we conduct meetings, um, looking at common areas like kitchens, toilets and things, um, and also looking at just normal reporting arrangements for accidents, incidents and emergencies. Um, moving on then to looking at how we manage customers, visitors and contractors to our buildings, how we ensure that the buildings are clean to the required standard, that we have the appropriate PPE in place. Um, we're looking at shift patterns and working groups, work-related travel, how we communicate to the staff and how we manage deliveries to the building. So as you can see, there's a number of issues there that we're looking at. It's a huge piece of work to ensure that staff <coughs> feel safe to return to the building as and when it's safe to do so. Um, across departmental team are currently considering all of these issues and ensuring that our workplaces are COVID-19 ready. Um, this includes looking at all issues um, in relation to health and safety, property management, premises management and all personnel issues. But it is important to note members that at this stage, the majority of our staff um, work from, are working from home and will continue to do so until the guidance changes. The, as you're aware, and we've briefed you on previously, COVID-19 risk assessments and safe systems of work have been completed for all critical services, and they're continuously reviewed and updated to take account of any change in circumstances. The risk assessments and safe systems of work will also be reviewed and updated for all the service areas prior to any staff returning to their workplace, taking into consideration these guiding principles for working safely. So at this stage, member, we would just ask you to consider them um, and we would seek your endorsement um, so that we can implement these and take whatever steps is needed to ensure that our buildings are safe to allow staff to return to work as and when it is safe to do so. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Denise, thanks for that report. Yeah. Just to add to Denise's report, Chair, the focus um, uh, immediately that the group is working on is the Strand Road offices, uh, followed very quickly behind with the Derry Road offices in Straban, um, followed by Harbour House. Um, so those are the three premises that we would be initially focusing on, um, making sure these guiding principles are turned into pragmatic steps to enable these buildings to function safely um, moving forward. We hope within two to three weeks um, to have all of the processes in place, all of the guidance in place, all of the signage in place um, in both Derry Road and Strabane and Strand Road and Derry. Um, not that we will be moving in immediately to repopulating those buildings with staff, as Denise has said, that will be in accordance with the um, phased approach set out by the executive. But we want to be in a place where when staff come in, or indeed for those staff who are currently working in the building, when they see other staff come in, that they feel totally safe and that they feel that all of these processes and practices have been adequately dealt with and organised in a carefully controlled manner. Okay, John, thanks for that there. Uh, Councillor Duffy, did you want in there? Yes, thank you, Chair, and congratulations on your new role, Darren. Um, wish you all the very best for the year ahead. Um, Denise, thank you for the report. Um, it is, it's a really comprehensive report and, and covers um, most areas there. Um, I was talking to one of the council officers earlier on today who has been working on this as well, and I know how, how comprehensive it is and how much work is going on behind the scenes. So I, I thank um, yourself and the other council officers who are working on this. Um, obviously, um, throughout the COVID period and, and beyond, staff safety is going to be paramount in terms of going forward and ensuring that, that all these new safe practices are put into place. Um, so, I, I, just reading through the report, in terms of the PPE, it talks about PPE at the end, and just clarifying, um, should staff require PPE, I can assume 
that council will be providing that PP and it'll not be expected that um, they provide their own. Absolutely. Sorry, absolutely clarified the council will provide the necessary PPE. Thank you, John. I, ju I just wasn't clear in the report, so I just wanted to clear that up. No, that's fantastic. And I, I, I assume that we're, we're consulting both staff and consulting with unions on their on everything that we're doing as well. And if so, I'm, I'm more than happy to propose this as um, I think that it's, it's very comprehensive and it's evident they work the council officers are doing on it. Okay, thanks, Councillor Duffy. So, uh, okay. you, you proposing there? Yep. You just need a seconder there. Yep. I that, sure. Okay. Okay. Is that everyone yet? No one else there. No. Um, that's okay. We'll move. Uh, that's finished. We'll move on the agenda item. Nine, which is the COVID financial update by Alfie. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Um, members, um, the report's obviously to update you on the latest financial position for the this financial year, taking into account the impact of COVID. And this more detailed report builds on the higher level briefings that were provided in the recent members' briefings. Um, just by context, members, and it's important to, um, I suppose, understand this, we have an overall 75 million expenditure budget as council. That's obviously under pressure through a number of cost pressures, but it's also similarly important to understand the funding sources that pro that provide funding for that sum, because obviously those are under significant pressure um, as well. In particular, you'll note how important its income is to us and also how important our service income and our grant income and our rate support grant are in that regard as well. Alongside that, members, we do have a district fund balance, which is within the guidance set out by DFC, and it would be very important, members, to um, prevent against future problems that we try and remain within those guidance by DFC. Um, and in the event members that our district fund did become depleted, this would obviously place us in an insolvent position, which um, would, would not be a, um, an outcome that we would want. So members, it's a requirement under the Act um, that we, the Local Government Finance Act, that we highlight that, um, and that it has a significant pr probability at this point, certainly in the absence of continued significant government support, that our reserves may be inadequate to fund our services for this financial year. And also, more importantly, what actions um, we have been putting in place and are putting in place um, to mitigate against, against that. So, members, the first point, we've done a detailed initial assessment of that financial loss. Uh, it's obviously a very fast moving situation and there are a number of planning assumptions need to be made to do that. So it's something that we will keep under continual review. Um, the key components of that are obviously the losses of income from our services and facilities. Um, which for at this point we're forecasting will be for a large part of the year and obviously keep that under review. Against that, we will have savings from the closure of premises um, that have been closed for um, up to now and um, some of which will continue to be closed. Um, we are continuing to keep our grant income under review and I suppose most of that has been mitigated, but there are a few areas which still have not been confirmed and those have been highlighted in the report. Um, waste management costs obviously represent a very significant portion of our overall expenditure budget and very small increases in tonnages uh, or very small changes in prices can have a very significant impact and a forecast of that members has been made in the report. Um, we've also previously highlighted the emergency expenditure that we have been and will continue to incur. And finally, members, we've obviously offset against that the fact that we've been advised that the rate support grant hasn't been cut for this year. Um, the final two lines in that table, members, relate to the rate base impact. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the report, um, rates fund 80% of our services. Um, the pandemic, members, is likely to have a significant impact on that. Um, but I suppose more importantly, a very uncertain impact. It's probably something we won't be able to totally understand for a number of months and given that a number of rates bills have only just been issued and that um, over the coming months um, stats around collection and whatever will, will emerge. 
but it's important at this stage, members, that we do have planning assumptions in that regard, and those have been included within the estimate at this point. So, members, that brings an overall estimated loss position of 10.7 million from where we were at rates time. And as I mentioned, we will obviously keep that under very close um, review. Moving on, members, to the steps that we've taken to um, to mitigate against that. Um, firstly, you'll be aware that significant engagement has been um, ongoing with government, both through, through SOLAS and the Finance Officers Association. Um, that has resulted in 20.3 million of funding being secured for financial losses and emergency expenditure, and 3.8 million of funding for waste management costs. Um, we will obviously be entitled to a share of that, and discussions are currently ongoing and hopefully going to be finalised very soon in relation to confirming our share of that, which I anticipate will be in the region of £2 million. Alongside that, we are obviously progressing with the furloughing scheme following confirmation that we could access that um, in, in May. So again, members, we're hoping to be able to recoup an excess of £1 million through this scheme, although that will be dependent on how long that we can keep um, the various services areas under the scheme. So again, we'll keep that under review. Um, you'll also be aware, members, that City of Derry Airport costs have been totally covered for the first quarter of the financial year, and we're in discussions for continued support beyond that point. So those mitigations, members, come to 3.25 million at this stage. Stage two, members, we have um, there's a second table there which um, sets out the steps we've taken in relation to recruitment, discretionary spend, holding of vacancies, reviewing of reserves, and setting overhead savings targets. Um, the two main items in that table, members, are the initial reserves review. And I suppose the main element within that, members, you'll be aware that we have a fairly significant provision um, against the non domestic revaluation appeals. One which was very important that it was there and which we would like to continue to be there, given that another revaluation has just happened. But given the current financial emergency, um, it's been proposed that we um, set that off against um, the, the current um, financial difficulties that we're in. Also, we have in your capital savings, as you will be aware, which um, we generally use to progress all our capital projects. But given the situation this year, it's proposed that those are instead reallocated to um, fund our financial pressures. So that, along with review of vacant posts and overhead savings, um, gives us a potential further 4.7 million, which we could offset against the overall pressure. So in those two stages, members are taken into account. That gets us to a position of circa 2.8 million um, at this point in time, um, which is a uh, a remaining deficit and which is a remaining challenge which we need to address address and if not addressed it does um, place us in a very difficult financial position so stage three and four members are currently progressing alongside each other um, obviously stage three is the continued engagement with government um, both two, there's two aspects to that members firstly um, we are as we speak submitting a claim for estimated quarter two financial losses around the loss of income and waste management costs and secondly members is um, now commencing the very important discussions around the security of our rate base going forward um, as i mentioned it obviously funds 80 percent of our services so it's really important that any intervention from government um, takes that into account so that ask members highlighted is that in order for councils to plan with certainty and ensure critical services can continue into the critical or the recovery phase, the critical ask of government is that rates payments are made based on the on the basis of our estimates with any negative finalizations being underwritten. Um, so those conversations are also in progress um, at the moment. Um, finally, member stage four, um, which is ongoing as we speak alongside stage three. Um, most of our cost members relate to staff costs, loan charges, waste budgets, rates and insurance. Um, so when those are set aside, um, what we've been looking at in great detail is our programme and discretionary expenditure budgets. Those account for about 11 percent of our overall budget. Um, there are elements of the members which have been committed to date, for example, our community services, grant funding, etc. There are other elements um, which need to be committed to ensure that we can avail of grant funding, for example, good relations funding. Against that, there are some elements of that members which weren't able to progress. 
Um, so we're currently doing a detailed review of the remainder of those. Um, I was say what savings. Um, sorry, Chair, I'm just getting a lot of interference. I'm just hearing it myself there. I, somebody get their mic on there. Quiet down there now. Go ahead. Go ahead there. I'll find it. Okay, thank you. Um, so members, we're continuing to review that, and that will be the subject of a further um, report. We're reviewing funds set set aside for capital projects alongside that, but it is important to note that that will not result in any delays to projects that are currently on site, or the need to progress of, with projects to avail of um, funding deadlines and targets. We a number of pressures are emerging members in relation to delays to contracts during the pandemic, and we're currently doing a detailed review of those as those are being advised to us. Two other issues, members, I think they are important cash flow. Um, it, it, we aren't in a precarious cash flow situation. Our cash flow is good. That's um, really important because that's how we pay our suppliers and, and our staff. So um, it's not an immediate concern, members, and I hope that provides you with reassurance. It is for some councils, um, but we will we're monitoring that on a daily basis and are comfortable that we have cash flow in place for um, a good few months ahead. And we're also progressing our nineteen twenty accounts in line with the deadlines, and that report will come to the next meeting of this committee. So, members, the financial section basically summarises all the points um, that have covered. Basically, we have currently an unmitigated financial loss of circa three million. We're progressing discussions with government in order to try and reduce that and hopefully totally alleviate it. And the particular ask around rates payments being underwritten is a very key component of those discussions. Um, Finally, members, um, just point out, um, given the significant um, events, we're obviously planning already for the 21-22 rates process. Um, a number of pressures are already um, highlighted in that regard, and those are highlighted in the last section of that report. But needless to say, um, it is a very difficult um, rates process that will be ahead of, ahead of us at a time when we also have very significant aspirations that we wish to fund. So we will be commencing the planning for that process immediately. And obviously, significant engagement will take place in that in due course. So in terms of recommendations, members, you're asked to approve the updated financial forecast and the steps being taken to ensure that our reserves remain adequate and to fund our services and also members to support the continued critical engagement with government to ensure the further required funding support that we need um, are provided. Thank you. Chair, if I could just um, add to yep. what Alfie has said. Um, firstly, just to thank Alfie, firstly, and his team. Members, there's been an absolutely extraordinary amount of work um, prepared by Alfie over the last, uh, actually all throughout um, the emergency period as we have been keeping you updated through the briefing sessions. Alfie also chairs this year, thankfully, chairs this year um, the Regional Finance Officers Group and has been leading on behalf of all of the councils in taking forward the bid to government and has been working to um, us chief executives and solos to try to coordinate all of that. So a huge amount of work has been undertaken with Derry City and Surban District Council at the helm of that. Um, and I'm very glad this year that we are in the position where we are on a leadership role in this and can drive it. Um, we are very pleased with the success of the outcome uh, for the quarter one bid and indeed the very, very successful outcome with uh, Treasury in, in seeking uh, additional funding for the airport for the first three months. Um, but as Alfie said, the two critical things in the next few weeks for government to recognise that a quarter two bid and indeed then a quarter three bid and a quarter four bid will be coming from local government collectively. Um, there is absolutely no way that we can continue with that burden. I think the fact that the Q1 bid has been successful augurs well for the future. But in a solace meeting yesterday with DFC, uh, a senior official reminded us that at this moment in time, the Northern Ireland executive doesn't have sufficient finances to um, to fund a Q2 bid. Um, but that is something that obviously the executive is making uh, 
deputations and taking reports to Treasury uh, to try to resolve. So our Q2 bid will be um, available and ready in the coming weeks. Um, and the other big key issue that Alfie has highlighted is that it is really important members to try to ensure that we can sustainably plan for the next few years that our um, rate income is secured at a fixed amount and that if there are unfortunately business failures in our council area that we are protected from that at least in the short term otherwise um, our services will suffer so there are two big strategic asks to government um, a repeated q2 bid followed by a q3 bid and q4 bid which obviously um, will hopefully diminish as we go through the year um, but also um, that our rate space income is fixed on the estimated amount that the councils would receive prior to this crisis rather than the actual amount that we might receive after this crisis is over okay john thanks for that there uh and thank you alfie for uh that thorough report as ever uh you definitely keep us well informed where the money matters are uh so let's now open this to the floor now and it's uh councillor cooper asked first there so and you chair and congratulations on your your post for this year wish you well and thank you paul is vice chair um you know start with a positive in the sense that because we have been so prudent in the last few years around our finances um the fact that we are hopefully not hopefully we are in a good enough position around quarter one at least for stage one um because of the uh the approach we've taken up until now compared to other councils you know we are in a much more positive position than than some and, and that's obviously to be welcomed but it, it's a, a positive against a, obviously a lot of wider negatives um one specific question and i you can come back maybe at the end on this in, in terms of just the overall report in terms of furlough obviously the 1.25 million is a reference there in terms of stage one um and obviously council is a 20 percent additional top up uh they uh, apply to that in terms of the salaries of the staff um just in terms of stage two uh you know what what our approach is around the, the, is there there's no figure on the report as i can see around the stage two of the furlough i know it's hard to be precise because we don't know what services will be back in place by stage two um and maybe less staff obviously on furlough but if um just to flag that up in terms of how we can factor that in uh, in terms of uh, any additional costs to council uh, moving forward um just in, in the wider sense around you know the the scenario around stage three and four in particular and in particular the, the potential uh low um income we will have from rates but whether non-domestic or domestic because people will obviously in many cases uh find it difficult to pay because of circumstances they're in uh, you know and sort of countering that with the fact we do as a council want to keep our, our rates as manageable as possible still with with growth uh, and uh, ambition linked into that but, but without uh, having a massive impact on the rate payer in general and, and having massive rates hikes and again a lot of this is crystal balling because we don't know what impact in terms of stage three or four uh, the lack of ability to pay is going to have um and this is again like the new central government ask move around uh, underwriting any potential under uh, underpay in terms of lack of income from rates but also around the new bids that are that are being uh, proposed, and I don't think central government in terms of the executive will be surprised. Who with bids in terms of stage two, three, and four? I think that they're expecting that. But as has been said, also, you know, the executive has its own financial issues, and, and obviously, when it comes to the, the British Treasury, uh, we expect them they they uh, come up to the market and, and provide assistance to the executive so they can provide assistance to us as we move forward. But it's just in terms of the council's overall finances in terms of you know we have a whole range of old debts in place there very high interest payments uh in terms of restructuring our finances not, not refinancing loans but restructuring the loans in terms of getting some benefit out of that reducing our interest payments i think that's something we should certainly consider pursuing going forward there's potentially at least a few million pounds to be saved there and all of that uh, could be used in terms of loan charges to pr pr basically progress still on, on capital projects, but also at the same time using some of that those savings to protect the, the, the rates in terms of what we will ultimately have to decide will be a, um, the level next year. Um, so I think that's something we should definitely factor in, be it as imaginable as possible. Obviously the very, the record low interest rates that apply at the minute, I think we shouldn't take advantage of that because um, you know we have to be 
looking at every single angle here to try and uh, mitigate against what is a, a very, very gloomy picture. Even even taking aside the seven million, we will save hopefully in, in quarter one, quarter two, or stage one and stage two, stage three and stage four. I think we should expect that there will still be losses. Hopefully not on the, the three point seven uh, sort of level that we're projecting. Hopefully uh, if, if we get back to some sort of normality in terms of business, in particular sooner rather than later. If we keep uh, above the or ahead of the curve, and the, the R number remains below one, and the, the lockdown can be eased as quickly as possible, as long as it's uh, safe to do so. Buses can come back, they work, and obviously get an income, and that rate says you will not be as big as, as what we're projecting. But even taking that into account, I think we are going to have to uh, expect some significant losses in stage three and stage four, and uh, we have to allow ourselves to be imaginative to make sure we can deal with those, not just in terms of our usual approach. But as I said, looking at our own overall finances and how we can use a wider picture to alleviate against that. And you know, the mention was also of obviously capital projects in stage three and stage four being impacted and all of that. Again, we are a council in the last few years in particular that has taken an approach that where we can, we will be ambitious and, and look at growth and infrastructure projects in particular. And you know, from our perspective, um, we still have to be ambitious with reason. Um, they give people hope, at least, and create employment, if nothing else. Uh, so we have to try and be as uh, imaginative as possible going forward and around how we, as I said, restructure our finances to make sure we have some leverage there and hopefully have support from central government. But again, all of that is uh, is in the mix in the coming months. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Cooper. Uh, Alfie, do you want to answer that question now or do you want to leave it yet to see if there's any more questions for you? Yeah, I'm happy to answer now. Um, I suppose the furlough figure of 1.25 million, the report refers to our forecast for the year. It's not just quarter one. Um, the furlough was based on an estimate um, between myself, head of HR, um, in relation to the number of staff we had furloughed. And obviously there's an element to project in there of how many staff will continue to be in furlough, which is why we need to keep it under review. Um, as services come back to normal. So that was our best estimate of that figure at that point in time, and we will keep it under um, review. In terms of the loan interest payments, obviously that's a big expense for us. We use loans to fund ambitious capital projects, and those have an interest cost associated. That discussion is live as part of wider mitigation um, measures. So, um, you know, we would certainly love to be in the position to refinance some of those older loans. We've been in conversations around that for a number of years, but hopefully the issues that face us at the moment will give the impetus to get that over the line and, and the lobby that we've been making. So, um, thank you. Chair. Just to clarify for members, um, we're not at liberty to refinance old loans. Um, we require um, direction from the department on that and varies from the department on that. That's been something that we've been looking at for many years. Um, we're, we're not at liberty to, to, to do anything about that as a, as a council at the moment until there's a, an appropriate change made to facilitate us to do that. Alfie, could you just clarify that for members? Because we, we would wish to be imaginative with some of those things, but are constrained in what we can currently do. Yes, ab absolutely. Ultimately, we borrow from the consolidated fund and government. So for us to um, get out of those borrowing arrangements, we need government's permission to do so. The current situation is that we would be penalised for doing that, i.e. we would have to pay the total interest to, and that, that would be remaining to be paid on the loan. So hopefully, as I've said, the current um, financial position we're in will give some impetus to relax that and allow us to refinance those loans. So those discussions are live, but ultimately it won't be our decision. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Thank you, John, as well. Um, uh, second speaker, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. And again, congratulations on your appointment. Good luck throughout the year. And I'll try my best not to give you a hard time. Yes, <laughs> 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 I uh, uh, again uh, thanks to Alfie for a very detailed report. And and, and reading the report, it's it's very scary in the sense when you see almost eleven million pound. But I um you sort of ease that and having a look at that. You know, 
separate than that, there is like a, a gross loss and then so net loss. And if you're looking at the net loss, it is not as drastic as, as it first appears. But nevertheless, it, it, it is quite a sum of money. But, and, and, there's, and there's a lot of variables within that that need to be overcome in order to get that net loss down to a, a minimum. But I, what, what I think what we should be really concerned about and our biggest priority is not so much our, our financial loss now, but the very fact that the crash uh, of our rate space, where when it comes 21, 22, we're looking to raise rates, the crash on, on the rate space will, will be massive, that has the potential to not allow this council to move forward. So I think there needs to be a lot of focus put on trying to secure the rate base and strengthen the rate base. Uh, and and I tell you, you see when this when this COVID outbreak uh, first occurred, the Bank of England issued a statement saying they were ready, willing and able and would bail out the government on all costs around us. So I think that it's important for us to secure our rate base moving forward that we and I'd like to make a proposal chair that we write to the British Treasury calling on them to subsidize the entire base rate in this district for the next two years as in 21, 22, 22, 23 to allow them businesses to build up the infrastructure that they had pre-March 2020, so that we would have uh, a secure base rate to move forward. Uh, and, and I believe that that the government, that the British Treasury can do that because the Bank of England has secured them. So we should be demanding that now. So I'd like to put that forward as a proposal, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, so let me see. You want the right to the British Treasury, uh, the government in Westminster to subsidise the base rate for the next three years uh, to help businesses get back on their feet. Uh, am I right in saying that? The business rate. Business rate. Mm -hmm. within, the, within the district. And, yeah. that, and that is, if, if they subsidise that completely, then that would allow us to move forward in 21, 22, 22, 23. So they've already made promises on, on this current year. Okay. But, but we can't, Chair, we can't start looking at striking rates next year because of that crash. Because the businesses haven't haven't taken on a penny and they, they mightn't take on a penny. For example, like our pubs and hotels, they mightn't take in any money in September. You know, so where, where is that base rate going to be? It's going to be a rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that everything? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, do, do we have a seconder for that proposal? Second that, uh, Chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else would like to speak on that proposal? Chair, sure. uh, I'm happy enough to speak on the proposal, but I'm conscious I had indicated I wanted to come in anyway on, on the report. So, yeah, whatever, whatever way you want to take it forward, either speak on the proposal now or take all the comments and then deal with the proposal. Well, I'd hold, I'd sorry, I'd, I'd uh, Alderman McClintic just before you, Councillor Riley. Um, right, I'll do you know what? We'll do, we'll do that, we'll do the proposal first. Is that, is that okay with you? It's not. Going over anything that you wanted to speak about there, Councillor Riley, or I'm just get whatever way you decide, Chair, is fine with me. Just want to just to clarify with which way we're going. If you're if you're taking the proposal now, then I'll uh, I'd like to speak on the proposal, but I'm happy to uh, to, to follow your direction as Chair. 
Right, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll do, we'll take Alderman McClintock first to speak, and then we'll come back and talk about the proposal. Is that okay, Councillor Gallagher, with you? Is that all right? Yep. Uh -huh. So, we'll, so uh, Alderman McClintock, if you'd like to come in there now on uh, agenda item nine. Thanks, Chair. And can I say thanks, first of all, to Alfie on a, a very detailed report, and you managed to put it into a language that we understand, Alfie. It sometimes seems inadequate to say thanks to you, but I think we're very thankful that you are also uh, chairing that regional group as well. Thankful also that you had the foresight to ensure that we had reserves that we had. Otherwise, we'll be in a much, much worse position than what we currently are. And obviously, the reserves, the priority at the moment is to use our reserves. Okay. So funding an insolvency situation. Um, it's scary to think that we could be £10.7 million pounds of a loss, obviously with other um, mitigations and income coming in. Um, I think our engagement with government is absolutely critical, obviously, and particularly for the quarters two, three and four. And we will obviously play our part in lobbying um, to, uh, to ensure as much as possible that we can put pressure on government to make sure it, it is uh, good that we have a uh, good report from our quarter one and hopefully it will be as good for quarters two three and four going forward so we'll continue to lobby for that support both at Stormont and from the Westminster Treasury as well um, like others I would be obviously very concerned about our rate base going forward the impact that will have on our council and on our residents as well um, and I think that the, the it is essential that the amount is fixed the estimated amount that uh, requested is fixed on the estimate rather than what the actual rate might be um obviously everything is dependent on so many different things and we can't we don't have a crystal ball we can't see what's going to happen in the future and difficult decisions may have to be made in the future but obviously we are hopeful that we can mitigate as much as possible um any inordinate rates um rise more than is absolutely necessary next year because our community is going to take a long time to recover from this i suppose in the midst of all of this um there is good news in the sense that the airport has been taken out of the picture up to the end of june and that we are not looking to have to put in extra monies there and i think that's something to be should be thankful for also thankful that our cash flow that we're able to uh continue with our cash flow to our suppliers and I presume many of them are local and I think that's absolutely critical at this time and obviously our cash flow means that we have no issues about paying our staff um, so it's really just a thanks to Alfie and I would be interested well I'm not speaking to the proposal as such I would be interested before we vote to hear Alfie's comments on um, what his thoughts would be on the proposal before we vote chair so thank you very much for that okay thank you uh, Alderman McClintock, um, I'll take Councillor Riley first and then we can go back to Alfie and then, okay? okay. Uh, thanks Chair, um, and can I agree with much of what's been said already, specifically in relation to points about Alfie's contribution over this past number of months, uh, dealing with the pressures of uh, of this um, impact on the finances of the council and, and as has been pointed out before we're very fortunate that he's in the position that he is uh, within Solus uh, making sure that our council uh, is at the fore of uh, of these efforts to to, uh, to, to stem the, the economic impact of, of this outbreak um, I'm conscious that uh, nobody has a crystal ball uh, as Alfie's outlined you know, we, we, we have got some a uh, sense of uh, a, a relief in the immediate short term, uh, but the longer term um, of, of this is still uh, to be played out. And I agree with what Councillor Gallagher has indicated in his proposal that we do need to look at uh, our rates base and the and the impact financially is not likely to be in this financial year, but in future financial years. So any uh, additional support we can get from uh, either the British Treasury or indeed the NA executive would be useful. Um, can I just ask Alfie, I suppose, a particular point on what you had mentioned in relation to the fact that we can't currently change the loan terms, the interest rates. Um, which government department takes the decision about whether we can or cannot vary it? Is that 
Department of Finance or is it uh, the Department for Communities? Uh, so some clarity on that would be useful uh, because I think that we, uh, political parties should be trying to, to make uh, efforts to to have that uh, to have that looked at because if, if we can avail of lower interest rates here that then that, then that, that that would be beneficial um in terms of council Gallagher's proposal chair uh, i i don't have an issue with it I, I, i'm just conscious that the treasury already has given money to the executive i'm not sure that all of the money that the treasury gave to the executive has came to local councils um happy enough for uh, the the council to to make additional representations for future financial years uh, and let's see what the treasury say uh, i expect they'll tell us uh, that the money goes over to the Northern Ireland Executive and it's up to the Executive to determine how much of that comes to local councils. Um, but we, we'll see what they say. But certainly, uh, yeah, a, a, any support that, uh, that that can be given to local government uh, is going to be uh, is going to be crucial in the in the future financial years uh, because I think that's when uh, the, the impact on the rate space is going to be at its uh, at its worst. Uh, there are other issues that I know uh, may come back in terms of like our own prioritisation of what we spend our, our own resources on uh, and so on. But I, I'm sure we, we the deck have played out over this committee and, and other committees uh, in the months ahead. Uh, so happy enough with the proposal from Councillor Gallagher. Uh, and thanks again to Alfie and to John for the report to date, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Riley, uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak in the proposal? No one. Uh, Alfie, uh, Alderman McClintock there asked uh, if you could come in and give what you thought there on the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Two questions. I'll just deal with Councillor Riley's question quickly first in relation to loan interest and refinancing at the Department of Finance. Um, as, the, as the lead department. And in terms of the rate based proposal, um, from my perspective, this is a critical risk that faces us, and everything that can be done in that regard, and every letter that we can write in that regard, um, I can certainly only welcome. Um, I would say that alongside that, there obviously is a coordinated regional. Um, submission that will begin on, and I think that will add strength to your voice. And I know a correspondence was issued into government yesterday through Nilga and Solis, highlighting immediate engagement on this issue um, was, was critical. So um, I, I support everything that we can do and everyone we can write to in this regard because it is so critical. Yeah. And just to add to Alfie's point there, Chair. It is top of the agenda of Solif currently meet three times a week um, and we're liaising hand in glove with Nilga and many members will be part of Nilga. It's the top item on the agenda. It's it's a, a the level of cooperation between Nilga and Solis in this has never been greater. So there is a joined up regional voice right across the local government sector um, uh, in, in respect of this matter. So, and those deputations are being made with one single voice, which is actually a very, very powerful, um, uh, hopeful sign of success in the future. Okay, thanks, Alfie, and thanks, John. Um, the proposal there is on the chat for everyone to see. I think it's pretty unanimous, and I'll just... Uh, okay, everyone with that, there's nobody against it or anything. And we have a seconder as well, Councillor Donnelly. I think we just go ahead with the proposal. Everyone okay with that then? Yes. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. okay. Uh can I have a proposer and seconder for that uh agenda item? And can I have a seconder for three? Okay, yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Michael. Yeah, second it by Michael. Okay. So, thank everybody in that there. Um, I will just sum up on that there. That thanks, Alfie, for all the thorough report again. Um, obviously, there is still that deficit, but. With money coming in, we are you're working hard to get that there down and doing a good job in difficult circumstances. Um, 
And we'll just move on to the next item. Everybody's happy. So item agenda number 10 is uh, job retention scheme. And I think it's Paula going to speak in that. Chair, yeah. um, the purpose of this report is to update members on how we will implement the job retention scheme, i.e. the following of employees, and seek endorsement of our approach to date. Um, the job retention scheme for employers was initially open for a three-month period from the 1st of March 2020, but has recently been extended until the end of October 2020. Uh, the scheme is designed to support employers whose operations have been severely affected by the coronavirus. The scheme currently allows employers to use an online portal to apply for a grant from the HMRC that covers 80% of furloughed employees' normal monthly wage costs up to uh, 2,500 per employee. This will remain open in its current format until August 2020 and further details of how the scheme will operate from August to October is expected shortly. And in fact, some changes have been announced since uh, this report was compiled. Um, this week, which we're currently considering, and will provide a further update when we when we get more further clarification. Um, confirmation was received on the fourth of May, twenty twenty, that councils in Northern Ireland can avail of the job retention scheme. So it was agreed at a council briefing on the seventh of May that council would utilise the job retention scheme and commence the process of following staff. So it's anticipated that during the, this first period of furloughing, we will have in the region of 270 employees furloughed. And these are mainly, mainly staff employed in leisure services, visitor services and arts and culture. And it includes our casual workers who at the minute we are still currently paying on a week average. In addition, we've also furloughed those staff across all services who have been who are shielding. And all employees have been furloughed on 100% of their current pay until further notice. And prior to following any employee, we consulted with our recognised trade unions and engaged with the relevant employees. So um, as outlined by Alfie in his previous report, it's un anticipated that the council should receive a grant in the region of £950,000 for the first period of following from March until August. And again, as Alfie has highlighted, that depends on you know the, on services and you know we possibly may have to bring some employees back from following depending on how we move to re re reopen um, services so it's recommended that members note the progress in relation to following and endorse the approach taken to date the process will be kept under review particularly in light of the new changes announced this week and members will be updated accordingly thank you chair uh thank you denise for the report uh, is everyone happy with that there? Anyone wish to speak in that? No, nope. everyone happy? We move on. I uh, could have a proposer and seconder for that. Proposer okay. seconder. Seconder there just now. Yeah. Who's that, Sandra? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for that there, Paula. Um, and our next agenda on items number 11 for media and communications during COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I don't know who's got, who, who is. Um, Chair Adele's on, I'm going to uh, okay. take this in detail, but I would just say at the outset, um, Obviously, uh, given the scale of this crisis, we did place communication um, as a very big item uh, to ensure that we prioritised it, both ensuring that we continuously communicate it with yourselves as elected members, and obviously then you could in turn communicate with constituents and businesses, but also we placed a massive effort on, on social media, print media and broadcast media. So um, Adele has just um, pulled this report together just to give you some indication of the scale of the communication exercise that is currently underway. Uh, and maybe just pass over to Adele then to take it up from here, um, Chair. Afternoon, members. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, members, the purpose of the report today um, is to provide you with an update on the role played by the press and media um, corporate um, communications team um, in response to the... Um, as
stage was to, from the outset, that we would provide very clear, concise, and I suppose very regular communication um, out to the public. It was very important, especially in the very early stages of. Um, it was a very fluid situation, so it needed to be regular and it needed to be very clear in what we were saying. Um, we also played a important health and we used a range of to allow us to do that. Um, the traditional routes of broadcast and web, um, but in the circumstances, social media really played a significant role in terms of it was very quick and it was um, easy for us to use and it was a great way of us communicating through corporate channels. Um, as well as providing people out, we were also very key um, looked when we were working from home that we were still able to respond um, proactively to members and all. Um, we, um, initially, we did daily um, service updates out to press. Um, we only do that twice weekly um, going forward. Those that go out to uh, the local, um, we were in contact with our media, government media departments as well, with their press offices to help um, make sure the was only, um, all information was uploaded. Um, um, from the website, so basically it was like a one-stop shop where consumer, business, or a pair that you could get all the information you needed in terms of what kind of sports available, how kind of services were uh, during the crisis. Um, we also, as you remember, you'll be aware yourselves that we would have, um, you know, through daily um, information from uh, relating to council and also key stakeholders. Um, that information we also relayed very importantly to the front of house staff, which would be like our reception staff and people who are at the at the core of get, um, meeting with the public, so that they were all informed as well. So, in, the, in addition to front of house staff, we would have also shared the information out with external stakeholders. So that would be people like in the chamber and the city centre initiative, um, for example. Um, um, another key thing for us was um, we found the mayor, um, the outgoing mayor, would have needed quite a lot of additional support that maybe um, during this time of protection because of um, the digital stuff, um, you know, we, we would have provided a lot of digital support to her in terms of um, video messaging, social media profile, and um, using the mayor to help get out those um, wider messaging um, and also, we put mayor and our elected representatives forward for all interviews for, for broadcast. Um, the media, we have a media monitoring tool where, which allows us to evaluate the content and the media information that we're putting out. And members, today we've I've attached two um, documents for you to have a look at, and they're for the two months of March and April. And basically, what they do is, and I'll explain. Um, it sort of monitors or evaluates or the content and the coverage that we would received and. And placement. So the AVE that you'll see in the reports that refers to an advertising value. Um, so basically, that would reflect if you had to say, example, um, book a, an ad in the paper for the article that gives you how much it would cost. The reach that refers to is the number of people who would have read, listened to, or viewed the content. Um, and then the sentiment is looks at the tone of the article or the broadcast and measures it in terms. Of, and of how fair or accurate um, that would have been in terms of was it neutral or, or positive. So members over that those two months um, placements, um, those two months we would have received um, quite a number of placement, 800 or so media placements. Um, there, we would have dealt with over 225 press queries and that there was nearly 120 proactive press releases were sent out over that period. Um, we, the reach was 10 million in print and over 80 million in web um, online content. Um, again, very positive in terms of that all our um, content seemed to be was deemed to be neutral and balanced. So that would have been good from our point of view in terms of the, uh, that the council's view would have been included in any um, commentary that would have went out. 
So members, um, I'll conclude with that. If you have any questions, please um, relay them through to me and I'll try and um, answer as best I can. But just before you today, just if you would take time to look through the reports um, and maybe an, and endorse the work that we're currently do, doing um, as we continue to keep you all informed as best we can going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adele, for that air report. Um, open this up now. And uh, Alder McClintic, you were the first one to come in there. And I just want to say thanks to Adele and all the team. I think one of the things we've learned through this whole um, situation is the importance of clear, concise communication. And I think, Adele, you've absolutely been a credit to, to all of us. The messages you've put out, the neutral, balanced way, the messages have gone out. I really want to pay tribute to you and to the whole team. And I think the whole use of social media has been excellent. And the mayor's video messages as well. Because I think putting the message out in so many different different formats and ourselves sharing the message has been has really, really worked. Just one wee question, and um, I'm going to try and bring this up as I'm talking to you. But on page 51 of our report, um, I see that the reach from council is 18,156, with the dairy journals 117,000, dairy now 92. Is that because they're picking up from our uh, direct council website? Uh, I'm just wondering why our reach, which I thought would have been bigger than all the rest, but as, as it's sort of like a secondary thing that they're picking up, if that makes sense to you. Thank you. I'm not, um, I think, um, Hilary, or I suppose the content on our website, we are, our, the information we put out is organic. Um, so we don't put any money behind it. So I think that term, that's why our, our value is probably down a wee bit further. And as you say, because we're, the information has been out secondary, um, you know, they would maybe have a, a wider following than the council. So that would just tend to, that they would, theirs would have their reaches a wee bit further. Okay, uh, thank you. And Councillor Duffy is next. Um, thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And I, I suppose I just want to concur with what um, Alderman Clinton has said and thank Adele and the team in terms of the communication over the last few weeks. It has been tremendous and there has been a tremendous amount of information that we have needed to communicate. Um, the, the briefings that we had as um, a, a council group, the information that then was going out through the press and the media. Um, in terms of the mayor, the stuff around the mayor was fabulous. Everything that you did there in terms of the videos and getting the messages out, um, it was all very clear and concise and, and to the point and on message. And we, we didn't defer from what the central government message was. And I thought it, it was all done really, really well. So congratulations to the team. I have to say the report um, I thought was fascinating reading and I'll, I'll be going back looking at it again. Um, I, I, in terms of the reach and, and how things are picked up, I thought that was fascinating. So thank you for including that in the information, Adele, and just pass on our congratulations and thanks to all the team. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Councillor Duffy. Uh, Councillor Gallagher is next. Thank you for letting us in. Uh, it just was a fascinating range and, and, and how these things work. Uh, and I would I'd like to come in because I'm, I'm also saying that this is governance. Uh, and when this came came about early, early on, you know, in March, uh, and, and particularly like governance of of our chief executive john there i and i don't tend to blow smoke john but i there was a lot of uncertainty there was a lot of fear there was a lot of risk and and, and when i look back and um, the particular the cancelling of St. Paddy's day period and the decisions we made on the 13th of march that i were and could have been seen at the time as very risky to council and the loss of money. But when we it's here now in June, uh, and we're doing you know, some analysis and, and, and some of the stuff that, that happened, I think that we should not forget those decisions that were made. When we look at the, the fact of that leadership given, those decisions made, very much uh, lessened the impact on, on this entire district. Like, like we, we 
we were in preparation and we trained 50 grave diggers, you know, and 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 other places I needed 50 grave diggers. And thankfully we didn't. And I think with that leadership that everybody then fell in behind. And I and I would say uh, people can talk about individuals, but I think the council the councillors, council officers fell in behind that leadership. Uh, and when we analyze it and when we analyze the impact that, that has made on the NHS uh, across the district, the many lives that have saved, then I think that that needs to be recorded and written up. You know, we can talk about you know the, the good stories and the good stories, but but when we weigh it up, the decisions made early on that were risky, that people didn't agree with, uh, the people didn't like, and when we get now to June and seeing those were the right decisions, then I think that that needs to be captured on the way forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gallagher, for that. Uh, Councillor Riley is next. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to Adele for the report. And, and as others have said, uh, it's very comprehensive. It's it, it's very interesting reading as well. Um, and so well done to yourself and the team in communications. Um, can I agree with Alderman McClintock when she said about the, the, it has this whole uh, outbreak has shown the need for clear, concise communication and consistent communication. I think that that's uh, a key to this because that people uh, in in these times struggle to find out where's the right place to go and our council website and our council officers um, were able to get the information into the public domain quite quickly and indeed help uh, elected members such as the mayor get the information shared around uh, so people began to trust us as a information source which I think is the crucial thing uh, that people then relied on. Well, we can go to the council because they, they'll have the up-to-date and accurate information. So I think that that uh, early work, uh, as Councillor Gallagher has touched on in terms of the, the council making the right decisions early, I think give us the, the, the trust from citizens, not just in our council area, but elsewhere, where people would check to see, well, well what's Dairy Strabal and Council doing? Because we should be doing what they're at. Um, so thanks to Dale and thanks to everybody in the communications team for that report. Okay, thank you, Councillor Riley, for that. Uh, look, Adele, do you want to come in there for anything else? Or? Well, fine, thank you. No. I'd like to be back to the team. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'd just like to thank Adele, yourself, and the whole media team, uh, like everyone else says, this previous speakers, uh, for concise updates right throughout the lockdown. Um, getting out, us out the, the the proper accurate information that made our role as councillors a lot easier. Thank you for that there now. Uh, could I have a proposer and seconder for that there? Yes, yeah, there's Sean here. I'll, I'll, I'll second it. Okay. Is that all? Yep. Okay. Uh, and next to Agenda item 12, uh, Scheme of Allowances. This is to advise members of the local government's LG820 and to seek approval for an updated Scheme of Allowances, which is set out in Appendix 4. Um, by way of background, I would remind members that uh, this committee in 2019 um, decided that to reduce the frequency of maintenance of assurance audit and risk, um, and to reduce, consequently, the responsibility allowance for the chair and vice chair of that committee, and to reallocate that to the members of the planning committee. Also, and, and obviously at that stage, the scheme of alliances reflected that proposition. Um, further to that, the Department of Communities, as was reported to this committee, refused to exercise its discretion to allow the, the council to pay a special, the special responsibility allowance to more than 50% of councillors. So consequently, again, we've had to revise the scheme of allowance. Indeed, in uh, January, uh, officers were authorised to explore opportunities to appeal uh, the department's decision. And this is actually ongoing at the minute. Um, again, subsequent to, uh, as, as I say, the um, Emergency such as such, and the Department of Communities also issued 
the circular, uh, which provided uh, a record of all of the allowances and also was specifically aimed at reflecting an increase in the carers' dependence effective from the 1st of April. So the key issues really are, are pending the exploration of, of the uh, appeal process with the department. Um, it hasn't been possible to make the special responsibility allowance payment to members in the planning committee, and those uh, monies have remained unallocated. And the draft scheme, as I say, uh, reflects um, the new, new circular which has been issued. Um, so subject to members' comments today, um, uh, the updated uh, scheme of of alliances is presented for your approval. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, thank you, Ellen, for that report. Uh, does anyone want to come in there? Happy to propose, Darren. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Uh, seconder, please. Happy to second it. Okay, Martin. Okay, uh, thank you, Ellen. We'll move on to the next. Item 13, uh, schedule of meetings. Alderman Guy, if I could maybe come in there in this one. Yeah. Yeah, um, go ahead, John. Thanks, firstly, to Ellen for drafting it. Members, it's the normal schedule. Um, uh, we brought to you last week the schedule for June and July uh, and stopped there at that point. That's the normal schedule then for the rest of the year. As you can see, we haven't at this stage put in venues. We normally um, toggle the committees between Derry and Straban. Just for now, because we won't know quite where we are in September, we haven't yet put in the venues. Um, and just to reiterate that um, we're working on the basis that during the month of June, all committees will be virtual, um, including full council at the end of June, um, but that we would review that situation during the month of June for the month of July and see if there is a possibility uh, for council committees uh, to be held in a, in a physical manner, um, potentially in the Guildhall Chamber during July. Um, obviously, that will be dependent upon um, any movement uh, through the stages or steps um, by the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, but uh, we do feel that it would be possible to hold physical committee meetings should the legislation um, permit us to do so. Uh, during July, but at this minute, members, if you're content, um, we would just signal that as a potential way forward and uh, review it maybe mid-month, something like that. Okay, John, thanks for that there. Uh, Councillor Riley, you yeah, thanks, come in there. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. John, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I, I'm just wondering uh, when you say that we may be moving to be able to do a physical meeting, uh, could we look at a hybrid? Uh, maybe whereby we have some elected members in the chamber, those that may be able to go in and, uh, and, and feel comfortable to go in. And those that are either shielding or uh, on it, you know, for travel purposes, etc., decide not to travel in, um, or will it be a hundred percent online, or a hundred percent in physical attendance, or can we have a hybrid? Thanks. That's, that's a very good point, Councillor Riley. Um, as you know, we did the AGM in a sort of partial hybrid manner last night, and it worked reasonably well. Um, I think when we initially talked hybrid, we were talking a kind of, um, for one of a better term, Westminster hybrid, um, where uh, when we looked into that, that was very expensive uh, for a fairly short period of time that we would use it. So what we were able to do last night was a very low cost hybrid, where we simply, the members of the mayor, the incoming and outgoing mayor, the um, incoming deputy mayor and the officers present, simply utilise their laptops in the chamber. Um, while it went off quite well last night, it was quite problematic to set it up. Um, there was an awful lot of reverberation happens when you've got a lot of people in one room on their own laptops. So we'll, we'll look to see if we can refine that. Um, there is the possibility that we could do some sort of hybrid scheme, but I think, I think a hybrid where we're using sophisticated technology is, is out. Our team have looked at that and it is exceptionally expensive. So it would be if it was a hybrid that worked um, 
with a low cost option. Otherwise, if if it doesn't work, we might be best to stick with virtual for July as well. Um, but I just simply wanted to say that um, we are looking at all options, and we'll come back to you around about the middle of the month. Uh, Chair, thanks very much, John, for the for, for that additional clarification. I certainly don't think in in this financial uh, pressures that we just heard about from Alfie earlier on, we should be looking at anything that is uh, in any way expensive. Uh, but it's it's good to have the clarity because I'm sure members will be asking that in themselves. So thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, John. Okay, thank you, thank you, thanks for that, John. Um, does anyone else want to come in there? Okay, I can have a proposer and seconder for that one. Proposed, Chair. Yeah. Second. John. Okay. Who's that there? Second there? Okay. Okay. So, item 14, uh, Nulga, Central Bulletin. Um, is that who, who who's going to cover Rachel, that? That's Rachel okay. here. <laughs> All right, Rachel. Sorry, I didn't see your name. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> Quite quickly, um, this chair builds on some of the the information already discussed through with Alfie's report and through John's report, and it's really to update members on the lobbying and advocacy support that the Northern Ireland Local Government Association (NILGA) has given to the local government sector during the coronavirus coronavirus crisis. Um, members will be aware that uh, NILGA provide a bulletin to uh, Council every month updating them on actions and, um, and initiatives and the May 2020 bulletin is attached to Appendix 1 for your review and it outlines the actions taken and planned to assist Councils to deal with COVID-19 and plan for social and economic recovery. It details how since March NILGA has driven a strong message, as John has already said, together with councils and SOLAS in relation to the financial impact uh, COVID-19 is having on councils' financial standing. So moving on, Chair, the detail of the, 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 the bulletin is provided in uh, 2.3 and 2.4, and I'll not go into it in any detail. And in terms of the key issues, um, what I've stated is that the, uh, the sort of a, a schedule of the meetings that NILGA have been engaging with SOLAS on uh, to assist uh, putting the case for the COVID-19 finance to councils, to ministers. And most helpfully, Chair, what they have done is they have sort of highlighted the um, difference in the funding to local authorities from England, Scotland and Wales. Um, they have outlined that the UK government um, have provided uh, local authorities in England and Wales with 500 million to support uh, economically vulnerable individuals and households, with an additional 1.6 billion uh, to go to the same local authorities to help them respond to other coronavirus pressures. Additionally, Chair, they've also outlined that in Scotland, 95 million has, of emergency funding had been allocated to the 32 councils, and that was very helpful. So moving on from that, they also helped on the 4th of May uh, present this picture to Treasury and to Stormont. And on the 13th of May, they, they uh, assisted supporting the commentary on the evidence session by Solis at the Department for Communities. Uh, then, you'll, as Alfie has said, on the 19th of May, uh, there was a 20.3 million package uh, to, to local government in, in Northern Ireland. And they'll have welcomed that, but they see it as a first step in a range of substantial funding measures and that they're hoping that a longer term financial package will be developed for councils. Um, so the next uh, NILGA executive meeting is due to meet again on the 12th of June chair and uh, subject to members views. It's recommended that members note the attached bulletin and the, the lobbying initiatives uh, ongoing by NILGA to gain financial support for the local government sector in Northern Ireland. And their assertion really that the initial 20.3 million should be the first in a range of substantial funding measures which will help uh, sustain council services and that a longer term financial package should be developed for councils thank you chair okay rachel thank you for that report there um is councillor riley any viewers looking in there or am i looking at the last one uh, I, I would, my comment was in relation to the last item. Oh, all right, no, but no, that's but, okay. Sorry, there, sorry. Uh, but, but happy with the report from Rachel. Many thanks. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to, to, to say to you, you know, Nalga uh, have been doing a great job as well, as along with 
John and Alfie and, and all our officers uh, and try and de recoup lo losses from various funding. Uh, and hopefully they'll be able to continue that good work. Uh, could a proposer and seconder for that? I'll propose that, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Uh, on the item 15, uh, strategic growth partnership. Those are for information uh, there. Yeah. Um, I just go on there, John. Anyone want to come on or just propose and second it for that there? If everyone ran through, read through the. I was uh, just saying, Chair, sorry, items 15 and 16 are for information. They don't need proposers or seconders, but okay. I'll, no bar. if there's any comments from members, we'll be happy yeah. to take them. And anyone like to speak there on the two? So noted, Chair, so noted. Okay. We'll move on then. The. Co Confidential business for decisions. Uh, and a pro proposer and seconder for that. Just uh, the minutes of the previous meeting, Chair. Happy to yeah. them. Thank you. Martin. And a seconder there? I second it. Okay. 